You're watching The Ready Writer, a show where I get to speak to writers of all different genres, mediums, and experiences. The Ready Writer. Are you ready? Hi, and welcome to another episode of The Ready Writer. My name is Casey Bell, your host, and today's guest is Jennifer Gordon. She is the author of From Daylight to Madness. Let's take a listen of not only her process of writing this book, but also her process of publishing it. And of course, more fun information. Let's listen. So first question, when was the, the, your earliest memory you can remember when you realized writing was something you acknowledged, something you do? Um, it was, I had written a few little things for school, obviously, when I was like seven or eight, uh, but it wasn't until I was in seventh grade, so I was about 12, uh, that I realized writing was part of who I was, like part of who my soul was. And it happened because I was bullied very, very terribly in school, and I had a great English teacher, and she let me, uh, on occasion, eat lunch in her classroom. Uh, and she had read some of the things I'd written in class and she said, you should try writing, it might help. And I would sit in her classroom and I would write story after story, I would fill notebooks and she would give me extra credit. And that was the first time I thought that writing was, was who I was inside, like I'm a writer. And then later that same year, uh, I had written a poem about a book we'd read, read in school and I was too embarrassed to have her read it out loud and say my name, but she read it out loud. And I just started crying as she was reading my words. And like, it was just so profound. So I think, yeah, 12 was when it really hit home, what writing can be for me. <laughs> I have a similar story, because um, when I was bullied, I would come home and write about it. And sometimes I would write a story or a poem or a song. And, but for me, I didn't realize writing was a thing until my thirties, even though wow. I was, yeah, I was doing it I, because I didn't do well in English class. Okay. I would always get C's and sometimes D's every now and again a B. So even though I was writing because basically my English teachers were telling me I don't do it well, it didn't connect that I should do it. Right. And so that's why well, it took me so long to figure it out. Well, it's funny. So that, that teacher who let me write in her classroom, I, my grades were really bad in seventh grade, seventh, eighth grade, because of the bullying. I, you know, I didn't do homework. I didn't do uh, anything really. Uh, so I was getting really bad grades. And, but once I started writing, she said, I'll grade you on this. Like, I know you haven't been doing a lot of other, your other work, but this is valid. So it was that year I would get like A's in English, but D's in math and science because I wasn't doing any homework. Uh, <laughs> um, but she was the first one who kind of saw that there might be talent there and at least uh, desire to, to do something. But I didn't, and I'd written on and off since then, mostly poetry. I did some work for like a newspaper for a little while. I wrote a comic book. But my first novel didn't happen until a couple of years ago. So still, it took a long time to get to, I can write a book. <laughs> you know, I think school would be so much better if teachers actually acknowledged the strengths of their students. Because the fact that your teacher said, even though you're not doing the homework I'm giving you, I can see this is, you're obviously good at something. And she actually yeah. focused on your strength and not the mundane stuff. So right. I, I, I thought that, I think that's a great idea. I think teachers should do that more often. They should. And I've had, I've been lucky. I've had a few English teachers specifically in the past that uh, saw that I might be going through some, some things personally and not to kind of hold that against my grades. Uh, same thing happened in eighth grade. I had a teacher who I, I hadn't been doing much homework, not been studying for tests, but then when it came time to read uh, Shakespeare, I understood it, and I wrote a really long paper about that, and he said, like, wh who is this person? Like, I was about to, like, 
you because I have to recommend what classes you take in high school and he was like I was about to recommend that you go to like a level two or a, a, a slower level of of class he's like but then you you turned this in and he recommended me to go to an honors english class and oh. i was like holy cow i got a d like all year in this class and then he said you know if you can basically get your crap together <laughs> <laughs> you could do something <laughs> and so every once in a while you get those teachers that can see outside the box and that's great it's just that's really great <laughs> so talk about your book from date like madness just give us a brief don't do any um what do they call it spoilers but no i know give us, I, give us a little what it is so from daylight to madness is a historical gothic fiction novel uh that takes place in 1873 um some people call it gothic horror some people call it gothic romance gothic fiction uh but it is about a woman who loses a child uh shortly after that child is born and her family believes she's not grieving in the proper way she's you know sometimes they say she's too sad sometimes they say she's not sad enough uh, but her behavior makes it so that she is becoming an embarrassment to the family so her husband and her mother-in-law plot to send her away to uh, a hotel so i'm gonna you <laughs> for <laughs> so she can rest uh, but the hotel is very clearly uh, 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 an asylum. <laughs> and so it's the story of uh, the character's name is Isabel uh, about the the oppression of women in the Victorian era and how we didn't have our own agency to talk about our feelings, our medical issues, and kind of what happens along the way. There's a, a touch of romance in it there's horror aspects of course to it because i don't think you can say victorian asylum and think well this is going to be a feel-good story <laughs> so that's um and she does she is a very haunted character whether she is being haunted physically by spirits or if she is just being haunted by her own guilt and grief that is not for me to say right now <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it is uh that's the first part of a two book series and the second half of that story comes out on november 19th so cool so why why what was the inspiration because this is a specific book it's not you know yeah. some fiction about what happened today this is you know centuries ago it's specifically I'm, I'm guessing in a specific town a specific state yes so yes. what was the inspiration behind all of this um this is going to make me sound a little crazy but i'm gonna go with it anyways because it's the truth uh i believe in past lives and for a while many years ago i was doing past life regression hypnosis and i had under hypnosis one time full-blown the first few pages of this book and that's all it was so like when you read the book there's a scene at the very beginning and i experienced that whether it, it, so i believe in past life regression but sometimes i'm not saying it's definitely my past life sometimes our brain tells a story to us for a reason uh maybe it's a past life maybe it's just something my brain was doing like a dream but I thought of that first scene in my book off and on for, I don't know, seven, eight years. And I always wondered what happened next. So I, I wrote a, a fictionalized version of what happened next, obviously, but that was the core inspiration. There was a very, very specific scene that I couldn't, I couldn't let go. And I thought, this person whoever she is if she was me if she was just a figment of my imagination she deserves to have her story told and i think uh not to get overly political but like in the past four years we've had uh, a feeling in this country of many people being less than what they are and i find that horrifying so this was i guess a little bit my way my voice taking back like a woman's agency when, you know, sometimes 
we don't have it and women definitely didn't have it in the 1870s mm -hmm. and <laughs> so well i you know when people because i write plays films and books and sometimes people ask me how do i come up with the different ideas and i sometimes don't want to tell them because um i'll tell you what happens and i'll tell you what i think it is so sometimes i'll hear voices in my head and i don't like to tell people that because i don't want them to think i'm mentally ill right but what i think it is is people go through bad things in their life and for whatever reason they die before they get to share it mm -hmm. and personally i believe it's god giving them a chance to tell a writer so that a writer could tell the story so that someone else can learn from whatever right. they were too scared to talk about because you know we live in a society where you can't really talk about like incest and molestation and things no. like that. So people take it with them, but then those who need that information, they, they need that someone to say, you can go through it. I went through it. We can get through this together. You can heal, you can yeah. forgive, et cetera, et cetera. They die before that happens. So I personally believe they talk to writers to say, this was my story that I wanted to tell, but I didn't have the courage to tell it. So can you tell it for me? Because as a writer, if it's not my story, of course I don't mind telling it because I'm there's no shame in me because I didn't right. experience it. Yeah. But we may have fear telling our own story. So when you the moment you said people are gonna think I'm crazy, that's the first thing I thought was, <laughs> oh so she might be like me, where yes. like, I literally hear dialogue. Like I can yes. hear the people talking and having dialogue. And usually I'm like, what is well, who are you? And I start asking what? questions, who are you? Why are you what happened? And right. literally, I'll sit down, and when I say the stuff writes itself, it literally it does. writes itself. It writes itself. So you I know, people believe that's what it is. Um, so this gives me chills when you're talking like that because I I believe that I you know I kind of I don't want to say I go into a trance when I write, but there are times I'm writing, and I don't plan things out. I just let it happen, and I'm yelling at my screen, my computer, my fingers, going, "That was the wrong choice," but it's. It's the choice that the characters had to make. Uh, my first novel, it took 20 years of being in my head, but it, it came to me because I heard a woman's voice in my head say, there's a ribbon of time and it stretches out so far in front of me that it wraps around me. Like it, it wrap, goes forward until it wraps around my neck like a noose. And I thought, oh, she's a ghost she's experiencing time in a different way and it took kind of 20 years to figure out who she was and then i wrote a book about her ab about other people too but she was you know she's in my first book beautiful frightening and silent which just recently won the kindle award for the best horror novel of 2020 so wow congratulations yeah, a week ago um it was crazy i was like i can't believe like this little book that i thought nobody would understand or get because it's about healing from trauma and and it, but it's also a ghost story but again I, I i i always try to write from a place that's incredibly emotional and i do love horror so there's horror aspects to that but okay well congratulations i didn't even know kindle you. gave out awards um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, honestly, like I forgot that I was even part of it until a couple months ago, I became a semifinalist and I was like, uh, oh, that's cool. <laughs> um, oh, I forgot I was part of that. And then I became a finalist and I was just like, shut up. I'm in the top five for my category. So weird. And I never in my life thought that my book, Beautiful, Frightening and Silent, because it is a very specific style of writing and a very specific story. I never thought that that would win um and it did <laughs> and it's crazy that's, that's cool so share with us as if as you can because i know it's a long process but i always talk to authors you know school they teach you abc one two three and when you go to college they teach you grammar they teach you blah 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 but there really is no standard of how do you publish a book and even though there's three different ways there are still hundreds of ways to do those three different ways and you kind of just have to figure it out. So what was your process in learning how to publish your first book? Um, trial and error. Um, I will say that. Um, I can't talk too much about specifics, but I was with a publisher for Beautiful, Frightening and Silent 
uh, for a while and I met a lot of really incredible people and a lot of very talented people through that. Uh, but for, for various reasons, none of them are terrible. Uh, I, I decided I wanted to self publish next time. So, uh, you know, for lots of reasons, just, I, I realized I liked learning about the publishing process and I thought, in the back of my brain, I still sometimes think, what if I want to start a publishing company mm -hmm. someday? So I decided to go it out on my own for my next book, From Daylight to Madness. And uh, so I am self-published. I do hire an outside editor, so it's not just me editing my book. I still need other people involved. Mm -hmm. So it's not like just me doing anything I want. Um, hired a great cover artist. I do covers for other people, but it's easier for me to hire a cover artist for my books. Mm -hmm. um, again, because I just need that outside person looking in on what I'm doing. So that was, that was my, my path to self-publishing. Uh, and I like, I like being kind of this hybrid author who is traditionally published and self-published. Uh, I don't have an agent, but I do have a publicist, uh, Mickey Mickelson. He's awesome from Creative Edge. So I have people in my corner that, that work for me and with me. And I have a company that I use uh, called Books and Moods, and they handle my book launches and things like that. So I'm trying to be a self-published author, but in a way that still is highly professional. Uh, and, and get things out there. But at the end of the day, I think I'm a little bit of a control freak, so I like being self-published. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, 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 I've been learning some things about the traditional ways, and um, I, I hear more negative from people than I hear, oh, this is amazing. And obviously, when you're Oprah Winfrey or Stephen King, it works, but when you're yeah. starting out, it's not what it looks like or what right. people think it is. And I and think so. things are things in the publishing world are changing so much. So I think even 20 years ago, there were still these, like you could still sign with a, a, a as a new author, you could sign with a publishing company uh, and get a big deal and get a big book advance. And then they would try really hard to sell your book. And those things still happen, but they don't happen as often as they used to. Yeah. And uh, I have a very good friend. Uh, her name is Paula Munier. She's a best-selling author, but she's also an agent for Talcott Notch. And when I was chatting with her months ago, she said, you know, the publishing world is changing a little bit, especially now because of the pandemic and the economy that, you know, people are publishers, big publishers, the big five are counting on the people that are already bestsellers because yeah. they're a known market. Uh, so they're putting a little bit more pressure on their big name authors. Like, come on, can you pump out two books a year? As opposed to taking a chance on, I would say like the unknown authors, the little authors. And then there are these great indie authors, people who are self-published or small press published that are really fantastic and they're doing very well. So it's, there's, it's changing the, it's the same way making music changed, Yes. you know, uh, 10, 15 years ago, the same way you said you wrote plays, the same way theater is changing. So it's not just Broadway, it's little black box theaters that sprout up in old factories and in malls. Right. And it allows, I think us as creators to take chances. Like, mm -hmm. I think for me, I don't think I would have been able to write the books that I wrote, especially I wouldn't have been able to write Beautiful, Frightening and Silent and have it stay the way it was, which just won an award, if it was with a major company. Because I did pitch it to a lot of places and I got a lot of acceptances, but all of them had said, you've got to change something. One yeah. of them was, you got to make the character funny. And I'm like, oh, his wife and his kid just died. I can't do that. <laughs> it's not a funny book. Uh, <laughs> like, hey, can you make him kind of dreamy? <laughs> can you make him fall in love with the ghost? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs>
I think it's rare for anyone to present a book and it stay exactly the same. Yeah. It's, I don't think that's something that actually happens, unfortunately. Yeah. I guess these publishers know their readers better than the writers. They I don't do. know, but... And they do, because I think if these, you know, the big five, the big, big publishing companies, they are a well-oiled machine and they know how to produce books that that people that are, I would say like in an airport would pick up before they go on an airplane, but now we can't travel anywhere. So <laughs> that reader is gone. <laughs> the vacation reader is gone. <laughs> so what advice would you give a writer who's still on the fence? You know, do I just stay with this job I hate and pretend like I'm not a writer or do I do something, even if it's just something small, like the one who's on the fence, what advice would you give them? I would say you have to write. If you think you're a writer in your heart, if you feel that you're a writer, you have to write. Uh, I held myself back for too long. You held yourself back for too long. Uh, and I would say, start, start small. I, when I wrote Beautiful, Frightening and Silent, which was my first novel, I sat down at the computer and I thought, maybe this is a short story. I had the idea in my head and I thought maybe it's a short story. And if it's a short story, if I write a couple hundred words every day, within two weeks, I'd have a short story. And the first day I wrote a couple thousand words and I said, oh, okay, it's going well. And, and then the story kept going and I thought, well, maybe it's a novella. And I just didn't put pressure on myself. Don't sit down and say, I'm going to write the great American novel. I'm going to right. pump out 120,000 words of brilliance. I would say, just put words on the paper because you can't edit a blank page, but you can right. definitely edit a poorly written page you can, you can edit word vomit and make it something else, but you've got to write. Like if you, if it's in your heart, if it's even just like they're burning like a little ember in a fire, just like stoke that flame and, and write something, write a hundred uh, words. <laughs> yeah. I like how you said um, word vomit because that's the advice. Cause people always say, well, how do I start? They just say, well, whatever it, you have in your head, it vomit it out and then yeah. clean it up later or you edit yeah. it later or you decide even if it's out of order you know it's out yeah. of chronology you just throw it up and then clean it up later it doesn't so have to I, be perfect yeah. first it doesn't draft. it shouldn't be i mean oh nobody writes a perfect first draft um that's when the characters are just trying to like you know tell their stories right. to us and then we're just like okay i'm just writing it down so i remember but yeah, so I always call my first draft, or even when I'm just in the, in the muck of writing, I just call it, you know, my word vomit or my vomit draft. And I also host a podcast, and it's called Vox Vomitus, and it's <laughs> fake Latin for word vomit. And we talk to people, we talk to authors um, about the worst things they've written. <laughs> so we're like, we know you have a bestseller. Can you tell us about <laughs> all the mistakes you've made along the way? And everyone's like, yes, I can. I have a few. I'm still, I feel bad though, because I have two plays that I don't want to produce and I don't feel like redoing it, but I feel bad because I feel like it's my work and I'm throwing it away, you know, like I feel like yeah. I should it, but it's, it's like, it's horrible. <laughs> They're both <laughs> horrible oh and I'm like I, I get that <laughs> find a way to fix it so it's not at least somewhat dis decent but you know there's like... there's probably there is probably good in there it's probably I always call it like good bones but bad meat <laughs> like so the bones <laughs> of it are probably good just I would say put it in a file on your desktop and every once in a while kind of think about it a little bit because yeah, I have a, a terrible short story that I wrote years ago, but I, part of me kept saying, it could be good. Like, I feel like it could be good. And then I reread it and I'm like, oh, it's so bad. <laughs> it's so bad. It's like the worst thing ever. Um, and then I put it away and then I was on a deadline for something and I needed a little short story. And I was like, what about that story? And I pulled it back out again and I just, 
I realized I could finally see it clearly that there was something good underneath. I had to literally like X out and just delete eighty percent of it, but <laughs> but I ended up being able to salvage it. Uh, but yeah, I say you can never throw it away completely. You wrote it for a reason. You said that before too. There was a voice inside your head that wanted that story to get out. So okay. eventually, oh, the story will have you. to come out. <laughs> Okay, so your last question, this is a, um, I think I asked you this with the um, art one. But if there was an author that you could sit down and talk with, they don't, you know, whether they're dead or alive, who would that author be and why? Uh, I'm always, okay, I love this question and it's, I'm torn between two. You can do two. Uh, yeah, um, so because it's like the two sides of my personality. I will say Shirley Jackson because she is the, the godmother of gothic horror. And she, her books are so petrifying to me, but also emotionally relevant um, because she, she wrote on that fine line of madness and horror where you don't know if somebody is completely bonkers crazy or if it's a ghost. And uh, that's kind of, I, I, I write in similar, a similar fashion from a creative point of view. Also, Shirley Jackson suffered terribly from agoraphobia and mental illness throughout her life, and she struggled a lot, and she managed to create amazing work out of it. So Shirley Jackson is one, and then Anne Sexton, the poet, is my second one, because uh, I love poetry and I love horror. But Anne Sexton, I'll say kind of the same thing. She was a, uh, she suffered from mental illness for her entire life. She ended up uh, dying of suicide. She was part of the Suicide Squad. Uh, her, uh, Sylvia Plath, all these uh, suicide poets that all grew up in Massachusetts, all were wealthy, all went to the same mental institution. Uh, she was a pioneer. She wrote about uh, the sexuality of women in like the late 50s and early 60s when nobody wanted to talk about it because girls were just supposed to be polite and cleaning the house. Right. And, and, you know, and she, she wrote about those things. She also rewrote a lot of fairy tales in her own poetic version of them, which made them somehow even darker than they were. And uh, so I would have both of them to the same dinner, but I feel like we probably wouldn't eat. We would probably just drink whiskey and <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it would be that kind of dinner. <laughs> Well, that's it for this episode of The Ready Writer. We want to thank Jennifer Gordon for her time and for her sharing her experience. Thank you for watching. You have a great day. On an almost uninhabitable rocky island off the coast of Maine, a hotel lives over the shore, an ever-present gray lady that stands strong like a guard, keeping watch. For many who come here, this island is a sanctuary and a betrayal. This is a place where memories linger like ghosts, and the ephemeral nature of time begins to peel away, like the sanity of all who have been unlucky enough to step foot on its shore. From Daylight to Madness by Jennifer Gordon For more information go to jenniferangordon.com